So this talk is about um, fixing broken windows. And basically, a broken window is anything in your software project that will slow you down and you, that you'll regret in the future. So essentially, it comes down to stopping criminal behavior. Uh, the resolution's a little bit, but yeah, so it's mostly animated GIFs, so we'll get through this pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so stopping criminal behavior in your applications. Basically, the things and the rules that you, know, you can follow so that you don't end up like this guy here in front end jail uh, for committing massive all sorts of crimes. Um, so basically, the premise being that when you start off a software development project, everything's going great. You know, you're taking off, you're going to the sky, and then shit hits the fan and it all goes to hell. Um, so, because eventually there will definitely be a set of things that happen. Like, you'll learn new code stuff, you'll adopt new libraries, you'll gain and lose team members, and it prob you'll probably be responsible for more than just JavaScript, CSS, HTML. Like, as modern web developers, you're going to be writing server code, you're going to be writing presentation code, you're going to be writing a lot of JavaScript. And, uh, on top of all of that, all of these kind of dynamic aspects that you can't predict, even these little tiny infractions that I'll be talking about in just a minute will detract from the overall value of your software over time and make things generally really hard. And so essentially it means that shit's going to be breaking all the time. And these are, there are things that you can do to combat that. And so is such a thing even possible to, to do? Like how do you kind of get through like a normal day-to-day -day like development environment as a software software engineer, and so going back to this premise of broken windows, and this is something directly from the Pragmatic Programmer, um, it's the, out, the theory that the outward appearance of criminal behavior can lead to actual crime. And you know, that's just as true as it is like in a social sense, it's true in a software sense, because if you fix broken windows, you can consistently fight software entropy. Your software is wanting to get to a state where it's broken and buggy and sucks and doesn't work, and the little things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis really affect whether that is true or not. And so even better than fixing them is to stop windows from breaking in the first place and not letting that crime kind of seek into your applications. So, and again, this isn't about fixing broken windows. Windows break all the time. Um, so this is about thinking less and doing the things that you can, doing little things every day that reduce the overall cognitive load that it takes to look at your code. So there are 10 things, uh, like really like more like 14, but we'll be going through like 10 things that we can do and to stop crime from occurring in a software project. And so what constitutes a criminal action? And so I say, and this is just me, but when it affects productivity, creates difficult bugs, boxes you in, confuses you later, these are things that you, you, know, you know you can stop and you're just being lazy if you don't stop them. So, and like any other criminal justice system, there are different levels of crime here. You know, there are minor offenses like shoplifting, mixing tabs and spaces, major offensive like regicide, modifying natives, that type of stuff. So, you know, this all actually kind of starts with a little parable, the developer that trolled himself. And so this is about, you know, a developer who thinks he's very clever. He discovers ternary expressions and does them inside of brackets to do string replace, replacement instead of just using an if statement like a normal person. This is the developer that doesn't know that, you know, minifiers can create small variable names for you and everything's A1, A2, A3, A4, all the way down the line. This is the developer that really just appreciates being clever. He feels good about writing complex code and not leaving any comments for it. And just like this frog who misses the sunglasses after 45 seconds, um, he's eventually gonna go back and kick himself in the ass because it's a terrible, terrible, terrible way to live. Um, so yeah, but if you disagree with this stuff, good. At least you're thinking critically about this and like treating software as a craft and not just something that you're doing to get through your nine to five and go home. So, so now here's where we're actually gonna start talking about like the meat. And I mentioned it already, but mixing spaces and tabs and putting trailing white space in. If you do this and you know about it, you're a criminal. If you do this and you don't know about it, you just need to turn on tab characters in your editor and otherwise people are going to tear you up in code reviews for the rest of your life. Um, so it's a minor crime, but it has major implications about process. When I pull down an open source project and see mixed spaces and tabs, I know that somebody doesn't care deeply about this problem. And it's not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but it's indicative of things that might be going on or things that might not be going on. So just don't be that guy. Don't, 
you know, you, there's a tabs to debate, a spaces to debate. <laughs> Don't choose both. Um, you know, and there actually even is a school of thought that says you can use both, but, but choose one or the other. Turn on tab characters in your editor and just like know they exist. Because, you know, somebody's going to code review you someday and they'll like find an errant tab character in a whole sea of spaces and think that you do not care about the code that you're writing because you effectively don't. Um, so yeah, you should care about your files. Deal with these things every day. Care about them deeply. And if you don't, at least make sure somebody else does. Like, you know, you can assign, assign an issue to somebody, like clean this stuff up, but like, you know, that might not win you friends in the long term. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, I have a hard time comprehending why people do this, but you know, it, it exists. So, um, so yeah, so number two, um, not having or not following, not choosing to follow a style guide. So there are a lot of examples these days about style guides you can follow. Rick Waldron has a fantastic one called Idiomatic JS. Um, the NPM style guide is very good if you like ASI, uh, but follow FAT's advice and know how semicolon rules work if you are going to do an automatic semicolon insertion style guide on your project. If you don't know this, um, you're doomed to have hard to, hard to track down bugs. Um, but really, please folks, find a style guide, adopt it for your organization. The goal being that the code that, you're, that you produce and that your team produces should look like one person wrote it, even if it's a team effort. But you might say, that, like, what if my personal style is good enough for this? I don't need someone else's rules. And that's completely fine, but you better know the language, you better know the browser, and at a minimum, you need to enforce code quality with JS Hint or JS Lint or whatever type of thing you want to invent in your own time. Like, make sure that you have a you have a script that you can actually enforce this stuff with. Otherwise, there's you know it's a complete free for all, and then you get hard to hard to track down bugs. You get software that decays over time because again, it's the appearance that somebody actually cares about this stuff in a deep and meaningful way. Okay, so number three, no diversion control system. And you know, this is a this is a minor crime. You know, you can get by in life, you know, if you're on an SVN team with just kind of committing and and sinking down. Or you can get by on a Git team by just knowing kind of git pull and you know, kind of dealing with the uh, with the manual merge conflicts. But like GitHub makes things really easy, but simple workflows have a really hard time scaling to larger teams. And if you don't know what merging, rebasing, using feature branches, doing pull, re pull requests, using Git blame, if you don't know what these things are, but you're still like using Git and GitHub every day, you've got some work to do because you should know what all of these things mean. You should know how to do these things. It's another tool in your toolbox, and you're fundamentally ignoring it if you choose to not like actually read the fucking manual. And so three and a half, then this goes back to like don't edit code on the server, even if you are checking it in and like pushing it back to like where, wherever your like centralized version control is. Just just don't do that. It's it's a mess. Bill O'Reilly will yell at you. Um, cool. So monolithic files. Everyone loves writing JavaScript in one large enormous file. We've all done it at some point. I'm not gonna be the first person on stage today to talk about um, you know, how you can use module systems and all that stuff, and we'll get to that in a minute. But multi-thousand line li files increase cognitive load and they decrease productivity. If you have to spend time thinking about where something is in the context of a larger file, you're wasting time. Things should be self-organizing, things should be self-documenting. And it's, if you're generating files like this with a build process and you, you, know, you do have to look through it occasionally, that's great, but there are also things like source maps and module systems that like, save you time in the long run. So again, this is about embracing laziness. Most good developers are profoundly lazy, and to create more work for yourself later is the opposite of laziness. So make sure that if you're being lazy, that you're like, being opportunistically lazy. And having huge files is not the definition of that. So modules, let's have an argument about module systems. Um, so JavaScript will have modules eventually, but until ES6 is ratified, and you can use it everywhere, you really have two choices. 
And it's CommonJS, which is awesome, but you need a build process to develop with it, you know, something that runs in the background every time, every time a file changes, you need to recompile them and feed them to the browser in a way that makes sense. And Browserify is an awesome tool for doing this. You get a lot of kind of extra node cruft that comes along with it, but um, at least you're being organized. Um, Require.js, AMD, again, I'm not the first person on stage today talking about this, but, um, and yeah, Require isn't the only flavor of AMD. I, posit that it's the only relevant flavor of AMD. But um, yeah, so Require.js is pretty awesome. If you've watched any of the talks today, you'll, or if you've watched any of the talks in this track at least, you know, you know Alex McPherson and Alex Sexton talked about it in earlier. But there's, a, there's still another problem here. So, you know, there's this actually, you can use both styles intermixed with one another, and not many people know this, but Basically, I would posit that this, doing this, and this is like the common JS in an AMD wrapper. Require.js supports it in every browser environment that has function to string, so it can actually do the static analysis, does it, and works in development mode. You're compiling in production mode anyway. So like, this is a hell of a lot more readable versus this, and this is like actual code that I pulled from like actual projects and like, this is really kind of hard and annoying, and it's the thing that really ends up biting people about Require.js, but look at how nice that is, and these can be sprinkled throughout the file. Um, just again, something to think about. This goes in back to like reading the documentation, like James Burke from Require kind of doesn't really tell people to do this, but um, totally works. I use it for all types of projects. It's generally a good idea in my opinion. Um, and again, avoiding a mess like this is kind of, uh, what this is all about. Hey man, it happens. Um, and so uh, you just spoke up, but, uh, but number six is uh, leave the effing namespace alone unless you really, really mean it. If it were a popularity contest, modules would just be jQuery plugins. And you know, I've been seeing this less and less, but it still happens. Um, and there are questions that you should ask before making something a jQuery plugin. You shouldn't just make jQuery plugins if they don't use the DOM or they don't use jQuery. It's not like your own custom playground for pegging stuff onto a jQuery selector. Um, is it generic enough for other people to use? That's a good question to ask. And are you going to release and maintain it? And those are the types of questions that you really need to make sure you're asking before you're just kind of blindly going into you know, the act of writing and releasing jQuery plugins that clutter up the plugin site until it's deleted again. And, um, and you know, you, it really just doesn't do any good for the ecosystem if you release a plugin that you're not planning on, on actually maintaining over time. And kind of an offshoot of this is prefer simple complexities, or simple dependencies to co over complex ones. So, you know, there are a lot of, it's very easy in JavaScript to kind of get to this place where you're writing A in a really high level language, but B kind of piling all these libraries and plugins on top of one another. And you should really look critically at every one of the dependencies that you're pulling into a project. And if you're not, again, this is about having opportunities to, to fix something that could fundamentally be broken. So this is one of my favorites, um, dead code. So. Every time you check in commented out code, you have to support old IE for one more year. Um, this really does go back to knowing, that's, that's a good joke, but like, um, you, everybody has done this, I have done this, you have done this, I know it, I've seen it. Um, you check in commented out code because you don't know why it was there, but you don't need that code path anymore. It happens, and hopefully it doesn't happen in libraries, but it certainly happens in like application code. Um, you know, like the guy that implemented this isn't in the room right now. Like, I'll just comment it out and keep on and keep on moving. That stuff accumulates over time, and no one's going to delete it if it's just commented out and like not there because somebody might need it someday, right? But know your version con control system. Use a single commit and say that you're removing X, Y, or Z and X, Y, or Z file. I don't know what it does, but I'm removing it because it was commented out. We don't need it anymore. Kill it with fire. It's done. Um, so, writing testable code, and this is going to get a little bit more substantive in a second, um, but writing testable JavaScript can be a really challenging problem to step into, especially if you 
are used to kind of the progression of you know writing jQuery code that you know kind of progressively enhances, modifies the site. Um, once you start structuring applications around around objects, or you know start putting ifies or anonymous doc ready callbacks in, testing can get really hard and it hurts your head to think about it. So well, just not write tests, but that's not really good. And so this is code that like I wrote back in like 2008, 2009. Um, it has a lot of anti-patterns in it. Sorry, i 6 users doing a jQuery browser, all this stuff. Like, this stuff is just fundamentally untestable. It's closed over. It happens within a doc ready. Nothing's exposed. There's all sorts of dead, commented out code, and just a whole mess of stuff that you could never possibly hope to test. And I wasn't into JavaScript testing at the time. And, like, this is the type of thing that, like, this is not maintainable at all. And you know, the site worked great. It passed QA, like, you did everything it was supposed to do. But it was hell having to go back and revisit this over time when this application, like, needed to actually change. This is a 543 line file, and it pretty much makes you want to throw your computer out the window when you actually, like, have to revisit this stuff. So don't, don't troll yourself. Don't leave, don't leave traps for yourself to find later. You can, easily to kind of set things up to be, in a, to be testable, but it does take the effort of actually going, going, going out and making sure that you're exposing things in the proper way and that you have a way of toning down side effects if they're going to happen in your code. And an important offshoot to this is don't retest jQuery. I have it in good authority that jQuery has a lot of tests already, and presumably most of it's well covered, I think. So, like, you don't need to make sure that if when you call HTML with a string of content that it's actually, like, putting that into the DOM or putting that into the element. It is. You don't need to check that. Stop doing that. You're wasting your time. Um, and this kind of goes back to another thing. Don't abuse global variables. It's very, very easy to get into the habit of making implicit globals. Thanks, JavaScript. Um, yeah, so that's global. Um, explicit global is not, not that bad, a little bit better, but lots of explicit global variables um, back to the other side of being bad again. Global variables destroy design information. Uh, this is something uh, Michael Feathers has an awesome post about this. I'll post my slides later, but... Um, but yeah, global variables destroy design information. This is a fantastic post. Essentially, you know, you don't think about this because you have to use global variables at some point. You know, if you're writing a library, you need to expose your code in one way or another. But when you're writing like a complex application and you're just passing things around and expecting a global to be there, and you know, maybe having a, that code smell where you like check the global variable and then, you know, set it, you know, use bitwise logic to, like, set it to an object. Like, that's kind of cryptic. And there are better ways of doing this. And you can probably refactor into using a module system to actually express your object graph in a rich, meaningful way that doesn't involve just spraying global variables all over the place and namespacing your application six ways from Sunday. So, so, and 10, and there's some bonus stuff after this too, but if you're not using a build step, do not pass code, do not collect $200. This is modern JavaScript. You should not be throwing 500 script tags onto a page. You should not be serving unminified code. It's just a bad idea. It's a waste of bandwidth. Um, and it's kind of clunky. Like, you've, makes you, it makes you feel like you're, like you're missing something because you are missing out on something. So how many people in, in this room use some type of a build process? Yes. Cool. So that's like, probably feels like half the room. Um, just remember that minification has its limits. If you're minifying hundreds and hundreds of files and you are still serving like two megabytes of JavaScript code, split that up because you're not taking advantage of the browser's natural concurrency of loading, of loading multiple scripts at once. Um, again, know the browser. Know how it works. Um, this is stuff that you can find out both empirically and uh, through sources on the internet. So, and make sure that you're shipping the code that changes. It's, again, you should be finding the things that are meaningful, that have meaningful changes. Alex Sexton has some awesome blog posts about, um, you know, how to deploy JavaScript applications at scale in a way where, in situations where bandwidth really, really matters. Um, really f figuring this stuff out and seeking, and seeking out how you can do this and how you can actually, you know, whether it's using the asset pipeline in Rails or, you know, using, 
using grunt to uh, to produce you know minified minified um, hashed outputs that type of stuff. Um, again, and grunt is awesome. I hope everybody's using it. Um, Doctor Cowboy Ben Almonds. I'm not sure. Is it Ben Almond? I think I I, I don't know if I spelled that right. Um, but it's plural. Okay. Um, yeah, Grunt is this awesome build tool. Node.js runs pretty much everywhere. Everyone should be using it. Um, and so, bonus round with a typo. Um, so, always use the latest jQuery. And if you're using the latest jQuery and you have to use the compatibility pro plugin, you have some stuff to refactor. And if those refactorings are coming from like a third party plugin that you're using, hopefully it's open source. And it probably is because it's jQuery. And you, so, you can actually like, make a pull request to fix the things that are broken in it. Uh, the compatibility pr plugin is awesome. Just run it with your console open, and it will tell you everything that's wrong. So double bonus grab bag round. Inline styles, don't use them. Modifying natives, don't do it. <laughs> UA sniffing, just stop it. Um, Ajax sync, async false, I just don't, I don't even understand why that's a thing. Um, don't do it. It's not, it's not doing you any favors. Um, and keep in mind that you know all of the talk about minification is actually probably about the weight of one extra JPEG or one big animated GIF on your page. So really think critically about the assets that you're that you're loading onto the page, and your sites will inherently be faster. Your projects will will run smoother. And if you've done all of these things, and if you're doing all of these things already, and if none of this is a surprise to you, give yourself a pat on the back. Um, Picard would be happy. Um, keep in mind, none of this is dogma. This is all stuff that's, that's very, it's very easy in the scheme of things. And, um, and yeah, have fun. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a wild world out there and uh, doing this stuff, uh, front end web development is probably one of the most hostile environments for programmers to operate in. And it gets, it gets worse if you don't care about craftsmanship. And craftsmanship is a very important aspect of software development. And if you're here at a jQuery conference, you know, it's, you're, do, you're already doing the right things. But go back to your coworkers. Go back to you know, the, the people that you work with. And make sure that you care about the code that you're writing. Make sure that you're doing things on a day-to-day -day basis to decrease cognitive load. And everything will be better in the long run. Um, and keep on breaking shit, because breaking stuff is fun. So yeah, I'm Sam Breed. I work at Quick Left. Uh, we write JavaScript applications, and it's kind of like a fun office with cats and GIFs and stuff. Cool. So.